Hello, my name is Annie and welcome back to my channel. Morgan Le Fay is one of the most well-known characters in the Arthurian universe, often portrayed or remembered as this evil sorceress who wants to kill Arthur or is plotting against him. But when we go back to medieval literature and look at how she's portrayed in those texts, we see that that is not always the case. Morgan is sometimes portrayed as a good healer who is always helping Arthur, and sometimes she is that evil figure who is plotting against him, but she always has this level of ambiguity, and her character changes a lot throughout the centuries. So today I will be looking at Morgan's evolution throughout medieval literature, starting at her very origins and the inspirations for her characters, and moving throughout the centuries to get to the 15th century and the Morth Artur, looking at how she's portrayed in different texts. Through looking at these works, I hope that I can illustrate a bit more of this complex character who changed so much throughout literature and is still very influential and well-known today. There has been quite a bit of debate regarding which figures inspired Morgan, and there are mainly two sides to this debate, and some think that she was inspired by the Irish figure Morrigan, and others think that she was more inspired by classical figures such as Circe and Medea. Some scholars have argued that the figure of Morrigan went through Wales as the figure of Morgan and eventually made its way into the Romance tradition. And they argue that she is similar to Morgan in the way that she treats the protagonist, Cú Cullen, and which is similar to the way Morgan treats Arthur. Sometimes she is his ally, and sometimes she threatens him or seeks to destroy him. And that is a very similar relationship. But there isn't really concrete proof that these characters are derived from each other and that Morgan was inspired by Morgan. There are just some similarities and it's not really enough to stake a claim that she came from Morgan. Circe and Medea have also been considered as sources of inspiration for Morgan, as they share a lot of the same powers. For example, Morgan has a lot of healing powers which resembles Medea's marvelous healings of Jason's father, and she also can fly, is a shapeshifter in some texts, and she uses the same exact way that Medea uses to kill someone in her text, which is a magic cloak, and Morgan does the same thing with Arthur. So a lot of their powers are shared, which led a lot of scholars to believe that Morgan might have been inspired by these classical figures. But in the end, there isn't really proof that authors were inspired by these figures, and they might as well have drawn from several of these figures and used them all for inspiration to make Morgan who she is. Morgan's first appearance in literature occurs in Geoffrey of Monmouth's Vita Merlini, or The Life of Merlin, and that was written in about 1150. And in this work, Morgan is described as a very mystical and marvelous creature who lived in an island with her nine sisters, and she was the queen of that island. She is said to have wings that allowed her to fly, and she was the most amazing healer. And it is in the story that we see Merlin taking Arthur after the Battle of Camlan, where he's very severely wounded, to Morgan, and Morgan is the one who tries to heal him. We see Morgan as this fully benign figure who is there as a healer and as this fairy creature who lives in an island that is Avalon later. Morgan's existence as this otherworldly fairy is short-lived, as in 1168, Etienne de Juan writes his Draco Normanicus, which was commissioned by King Henry II. And in it, he describes Morgan as the eternal nymph who takes her brother Arthur and heals him. And so in this one line, he really changes the character of Morgan because she's now Arthur's sister. Chrétien de Troyes in his 1170s romances, Eric and Anid and Yvain, picks up on this development as he introduces Morgan in his texts as Arthur's sister. And she is still a very benign figure. She provides healing ointments to knights in King Arthur's court, healing Eric in his romance. And these ointments are magical, saying that they could heal any wound they were applied on if they were applied for a week. 
Interestingly, Chrétien doesn't really introduce Morgan, he just says, oh, Morgan, Arthur's sister, as if his audience already knew who she was. So it is likely that by the end of the 12th century, people are already familiar with the figure of Morgan Le Fay. So far, we've only had good portrayals of Morgan as this healing figure who is an ally to King Arthur, but that starts to change at the end of the 12th century. In his translation of Chrétien's Eric, the great German writer Hartmann von Aue writes about Morgan as Fay Morgan, who is a fairy, and he describes her as this great shapeshifter who could change men into animals and beasts, and she could command animals and devils. He says that she could command demons and she was kin with demons. But even though we get this darker association of Morgan with devils, she still uses magic to heal Eric in this romance, so she is not fully evil. So now we get to the 13th century, which arguably changed the presentation of Morgan's character the most, as the Vulgate and the post-Vulgate cycles were written. And in them, Morgan changes a lot, even within the texts, she can go from a good character to an evil character very fast. So let's start with the Vulgate, which was written in the early 13th century, and it contains five different works, which write down the histories of Merlin, of Lancelot, and of the Holy Grail, and of Arthur's death and the failure of his kingdom. Morgan features in some of these works, and her portrayal changes from work to work as they were likely written by different authors. And let's start with the Merlin, in which she is said to be the bastard daughter of the Grain, who is Uther's wife, and so she is Arthur's half-sister. And in this work, it is said that Morgan was sent to a nunnery at an early age, and there she acquired a lot of knowledge, which gave her the name Morgan Le Fay, and it that was the source of her magic. In the Vulgate Lancelot, however, we get a very different Morgan from all the ones that we've seen before, as she is almost completely evil. We learn that instead of being sent to a nunnery, Morgan this time learns her magic from Merlin himself, who she forms a relationship with, and he is very much in love with her and teaches her everything he knows. Morgan is not very favorably described in this, as she is said to be the most lustful woman in the world, and she is described to be very ugly. Morgan does not, however, hate Arthur in this text as of yet. She hates Guinevere instead. And this becomes a very long feud that we can see throughout lots of works. And it all begins because Morgan is in love with Guinevere's nephew, Guillemore, and he loves her back. But Guinevere finds out about this and wanting to protect her nephew, she convinces him to leave Morgan. But Morgan, who is very much in love with him and pregnant, gets devastated and starts hating Guinevere from that point. And that is when Morgan leaves the court and goes to learn magic with Merlin. So throughout the Vulgate Lancelot, Morgan wants to do everything that she can to hurt Guinevere. And when she finds out that Lancelot is Guinevere's lover, she captures him and imprisons him for years and she tries to seduce him, but ultimately fails. After this failed attempt at seduction, Morgan holds a lot of resentments towards Lancelot, both hating him and loving him at the same time. So the Morgan in the Vulgate Lancelot is undoubtedly evil, but she doesn't hate Arthur or chivalry in general. Her hatred towards people is mostly personal and very much focused on Guinevere and Lancelot in this text. In the post-Vulgate, however, we see the shift from hating Lancelot and Guinevere to hating Arthur as well, at least in some parts of the text. Again, Morgan's portrayal is different even within the post-Vulgate. The post-Vulgate is a reworking of the Vulgate, which was written a few years after or even during the time that the Vulgate was written. For the first time, we see Morgan actively trying to destroy Arthur and his kingdom. One story that is later repeated in Mallory's Mort Arthur is the story of how Arthur, who trusted Morgan and loved her very much as his sister, he gave her Excalibur and a scabbard that was meant to heal whoever had it on, and so the person who wore it would never suffer a mortal injury. And Morgan, having Excalibur and this magical item, 
gives it away to her lover in an attempt to kill Arthur, but this ultimately fails and Morgan is revealed to be a traitor. But then she just runs away and throws a scabbard on a lake, forever losing it. And it is said in the text that she, her motivation for hating Arthur so much is that she is evil and he is honorable. And as an evil person, she must hate someone who is so honorable as Arthur. So it's not a very strong motivation, but it still drives her to try to destroy Arthur many times in the post Vulgate. However, even though she is very evil in the post Vulgate suite of Merlin, she is not in the quest for the Holy Grail and the Morth Arthur, as she is presented as Arthur's ally in these two parts of the post Vulgate and welcomes Arthur with open arms as his sister and tries to expose the affair between Lancelot and Guinevere, saying that she hated Lancelot so much for betraying her brother. So even within these works, we see this very completely different presentation of Morgan and where she is fully evil and wants to destroy Arthur, but in the same work later on, she wants to help him expose the affair because she thinks that harmed his honor. So now let's do a little bit of a time jump and go to one of the works where Morgan is most famously portrayed, and that is Sir Gawain and the Green Knight. In this work, a knight comes to King Arthur's court and says that he will challenge anyone to strike him once, and then he will have the right to strike them back a year later. And Gawain says, all right, I will strike you, and he goes and cuts off the knight's head. But then the knight picks up his own head and leaves the court, saying that in one year he will give back the blow. So spoiler alert for Sir Gawain and the Green Knight, but at the end of the romance, after Gawain had a lot of adventures, it is revealed that Morgan was responsible for the entire thing. She wanted to frighten Guinevere to death by having the knight hold up his head in court in front of her. And we are not given a reason for her hatred of Guinevere, so it is possible that the author just expected his audience to know of this long-lasting feud between the two of them. Morgan is still Arthur's sister in this text, as she is said to be Gawain's aunt, and she is described as very ugly, uglier than in the Vulgate, and she is still very powerful as she is able to keep Bertilac from dying after having his head cut off. Interestingly, Morgan is described as Morgan the goddess in a passage in this text, even though she has very human connections. Now let's end with a work that compiled basically all the sources I've been talking about and wrote this great Arthurian story, and that is the 15th century Le Morte Arthur by Sir Thomas Mallory. Though Mallory likely had access to different portrayals of Morgan, both good and evil, Morgan is mostly portrayed as an evil character throughout Le Morte Arthur, always trying to get Arthur off the throne or to kill him or to expose Guinevere, and she has all these plots throughout the text. In this text, Morgan is still Arthur's sister, and she acquires her knowledge of magic through a nunnery, where she gains a lot of knowledge and learns witchcraft. Throughout the text, she tries to kill Arthur. We see the plot of the sword given to her lover again and the scabbard, and we also see her present Arthur with a poison cloak that would kill anyone who wore it, and that harkens back to Medea and her own magical cloak. But despite all the plotting and treachery shown throughout the Mort d'Arthur, the final appearance of Morgan in this text is somewhat puzzling, as when Arthur is mortally wounded, being sent off to Avalon to be healed, he is put on a boat, and in that boat are four women, and one of them is Morgan Le Fay. And when she sees Arthur wounded being carried onto the boat, she says, oh my dear brother, why have you taken so long to get here? And she is visibly concerned for her brother and scared that he won't survive this. So in this final appearance of Morgan, we get this really affectionate scene between her and Arthur, which shows her concern for her brother that in the same text, she tried to kill many times. Whether this was 
Mallory trying to keep with the tradition started by Jeffrey of Monmouth where Morgan is one of the ladies that helps Arthur get to Avalon or whether this was just a different portrayal of Morgan, a different side of Morgan that we hadn't seen throughout the Morth Arthur, we won't really know, but it has caused a lot of conversation and it really changes the portrayal of Morgan throughout this text where she seems to be very evil and plotting throughout, but at the very end, she cares for her brother and wants to heal him in Avalon. So Morgan Le Fay has a really complicated history in Arthurian literature, her portrayal changing drastically from text to text, and even within the same text as we saw with the post-Vulgate and with the Morth Arthur. Today, her fame as the evil witch and the sorcerer still precedes her, as she is adapted into many different characters, but she always has that level of ambiguity, and that is what makes Morgan such a fascinating character to study and to analyze throughout medieval literature. So I hope you enjoyed learning a bit more about Morgan, and thank you so much for watching this video. I will see you next time.